Let me read a text from the book of Revelation to begin with, which to me is just a wonderful pastoral expression. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. Uh, it, to me is a poetic expression of who a pastor is, a brother or a sister, companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus Christ. If I had one objective in the next few minutes in talking with you about the book of <coughs> Revelation, it would be, I would love for you to see it as accessible, as teachable, as a material that can be used effectively in preaching and in shaping the household of faith. I think that it's just as necessary for young disciples as for people who have been in the faith for many decades. It is a book that I think is sadly neglected. I see it as a kind of um, canonical, symphonic conclusion to the Word of God. And as I've, you know, this study has, has been on for a, a long time, uh, this, uh, the work in the book of Revelation. I, I remember as a teenager reading John Wolverd's 300-page commentary in the book of Revelation. The time John Wolverd was the president of Dallas Theological Seminary. And I just ate up all that dispensational complexity, <clears throat> feeding my curiosity, trying to figure things out. And then I, I went to Wheaton and obtained a different biblical hermeneutic and uh, began to see dispensationalism more as a, as a distraction, a kind of imposed hermeneutic on the text. And that, of course, is where we get controversial about the book. I mean, the first question is always, are you on-mill, pre-mill, post-mill? Which I think is exactly the very wrong question to be asking. A year ago, I was on sabbatical. And I went to northern Ghana. This was my sixth trip, fifth trip at that time. I've been one more time since. And on that fifth trip, we went through the book of Revelation. <coughs> and for the first time, I was really able to work through the book of Revelation with people that were completely uninformed by the Left Behind series, <laughs> by a dispensational approach to the text. And Ghana has always been very attractive to me because it is like the book of Acts. It's the first generation of believers. And it's also steeped in idolatry and uh, shamanism and many of the same sort of pagan idolatrous concerns that the Apostle John was writing into from Patmos. And it, gives me, it gave me a kind of biblical laboratory in which to work. And if you do that with first century believers, you find, you discover fairly quickly that the book of Revelation is much more understandable than it is to us. Um, John is, is kind of producing a one-act drama that was heard in one sitting, and I think it was understood and he drives home the complexity of evil and the wonder of God's mercy and goodness. And there's a spiraling intensity between worship and judgment, worship and judgment. Seven letters, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, along with numbered meaning three being the number of God, four being the number for the world, seven being the number of perfection and completion, ten also being that number of excellence. And he weaves this uh, drama. Instead of Jesus' parables of masters and <coughs> servants and seeds and sons, he has cosmic parables of stars and kingdoms. 
And he is taught by the Savior a vocabulary of metaphor and parable, and he weaves these in, in I think a most profound way. Uh, so I, I have said that I think the book of Revelation is the devil's favorite book because he's just about convinced a lot of pastors that this is untouchable material. I can't preach this. One student um, said, I want to read what he said. He uh, said this in class, and then I went back and um, took it down, paraphrased it. He said in class, I'm both angry and sad. I'm angry because my tradition has imposed on the Bible an end time scenario that is not grounded in the Bible. I am sad because what was meant to inspire, to encourage, to deepen faith, has been used instead to fuel curiosity and speculation. Needless controversy has kept me from this important biblical book. Now, oftentimes, if we do do the book of Revelation, we stop with the seven letters to the churches. And we don't open up into uh, chapters 4 and 5 and 6 of the great throne vision of Christ. There's seven visions of Christ through the book of Revelation. And there's just a, there's this um, almost, a, you, whatever musical analogy you like best, either the symphony or jazz, you can put it to music in the book of Revelation. There is a beat to it. There is a rhythm to it. And powerful images that I think are relatively easy, if we think about it, to interpret. I used to think that John must have been in a heightened state of consciousness, kind of an existential, spiritual combustion, where his quill pen couldn't keep up with what he was feeling, what he was seeing. That's when I was younger, but now, come to the conclusion that he was really an Old Testament theologian. Working all of these texts, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, uh, filled with, I mean, saturated with scripture. And then in the spirit, working this out in this drama, this conclusion to the meta-narrative. Nothing's new in the book of Revelation that hasn't already been said in the canon. But it is bringing it to a crescendo. It's bringing it to a powerful conclusion that really needs to be heard. And it is an audible book. It's an audible book. It's meant to be heard. And in the hearing of it, in the resonancy of it, one is drawn to worship. And if you read the book of Revelation carefully, there's a series of ends, like the the sixth seal, after the fifth seal of the saints under the altar praying earnestly, the sixth seal is the end. You read that sixth seal and there's nothing more to do. It's all over. But John said, no, it's not the end. And the same with the sixth trumpet. And then finally you get to the bowls and, you know, it's, everything's wiped out. It's all done. But no, it's not done. Now you get the picture of the great city and the great prostitute. And again, this structural tension between, you mean what you say in the great city is the same as your description of the great prostitute? Or the holy city of Jerusalem is comparable to the bride of Christ? Working these two themes in such a way as to impress us with God's truth? I just, uh, if you get my appeal to teach, preach, and use the book of Revelation for your spiritual direction, for your guidance. This started for me, as I said, when I was a teenager. And then uh, I did a, uh, I remember doing a three-month Sunday school class at Cherry Creek Press in Denver. And I would have forgotten that if somebody hadn't this week from the Denver church called me and reminded me of going through that particular three-month series. And then when I went to San Diego, we took the book of Revelation for a Lenten series. 
did a study book and our small groups all focused on the book of Revelation and studied it along with the study guide and then I would preach on the text on Sunday. And we just sort of brought the whole congregation, I think, to Sunday focused on what John was describing to us from the book of Revelation. Great experience. At the very same time, my mother was dying. And I had the intensity of her slow decline, uh, and she died before the series ended, uh, as we were moving toward Easter. And it seemed almost like it was providential that these two highly intense scripture, worship and judgment, was corresponding in my own personal life with high intensity and all kind of converging. Another time in there, um, I went to Lake Banff, Lake Louise in Banff, Alberta, for a Christian Medical and Dental Society meeting. And only Canadians would do this. Sorry, David, forgot you were here. Um, <laughs> Everyone forgets the Canadians. That's the <laughs> Here's a, a Christian Medical and Dental Society group, about 100 people meeting at Lake Louise. Uh, beautiful, beautiful setting. And uh, Eugene Peterson was going through the Gospel of John. And I had said yes before I had known that Eugene Peterson was going to be there. I had said yes, and I was going to go through the book of Revelation. Of course, he had written Reverse Thunder, which I would highly recommend to you as a great book for getting into the book of Revelation from a pastoral perspective. So the first hour, a missionary, a Canadian missionary, spoke about his work in, in a devotional way. And then the second hour, the second hour, Eugene Peterson spoke from the Gospel of John. And then third hour, this is the third hour. You've been sitting now for two hours. I had the book of Revelation with Eugene Peterson in the audience listening to me try to work my way through uh, this book. Uh, I guess all that to say is begin now. Start now. Don't wait until you're 50 or 60. Um, start, start now to understand this book that brings to such a powerful conclusion the canon. Wrapping up all of those biblical prophecies and pointing to Jesus Christ. Let me read just very quickly two sections. Um, this gives you, hopefully, a taste. Poet Pastor. Some debate whether or not the Revelation was written by the Apostle John, but no one questions whether or not the author was a poet. He wrote with an eye toward the ear, he dipped his stylus in the genres of apocalypse, epistle, and prophecy, and created a compelling, audible sermon best preached in a worshiping congregation. In less time than it takes to watch a movie, our poet, pastor, prophet offers the hearer a vivid portrait of Christ, a concise critique of the church, a triumphant vision of redemption. He is an artist, painting a picture in metaphor and symbol, invoking adrenaline-rich imagery to awaken all of our senses to the stampede of evil and the cry of the saints. Alternating beats of worship and judgment set the pulsating rhythm for the revelation. The bugle blasts of judgment announce Exodus-style plagues and the wrath of the Lamb. The stage is set for the unrelenting witness of the church. The end of all ends is put off while the drama of salvation is retold in cosmic imagery and the unholy trinity of the dragon, the sea beast, and the land beast exert their domination over all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave. In spite of evil's bluster, the followers of the Lamb prevail. They sing a new song, no lie is on their lips. The angelic word proclaims, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, accompanied by the horror of everlasting torment and the great winepress of God's wrath. No one who is squeamish on judgment or soft on evil will find this imagery easy. 
John describes the final end over and over before taking a closer look at the great prostitute in the great city. Evil is numbered, deciphered, identified, embodied, secularized, sexualized, urbanized, stripped, and cannibalized. Her lament is not whimpered by distraught mourners, but shouted out with such authority by a mighty angel that all of creation rejoices. Her magic spell is definitively broken forever, and the great multitude in heaven resounds with fourfold thunderous, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. But our poet pastor is not finished, portraying the end of evil and the beginning of a new heaven and a new earth. He contrasts the wedding supper of the Lamb and the great supper of God. Worship and judgment remain in spiraling intensity. Satan's power to deceive is checked, and the millennial martyrs prevail right up to the end when Satan takes his last stand at the conflagration of Armageddon. John describes the great white throne judgment, the second death, and the holy city coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. The prophet's spirit-inspired literary artistry holds our attention as he unveils the ever-fruitful, everlasting garden city of Shalom. The Lord has really blessed the church with this book. So I would encourage you to embrace it. Uh, Dr. George gave me the good news this morning. I wasn't even looking for the news. But he's suggesting that we take the book of Revelation next fall in chapel. And I would heartily agree. I think that that would be a, a great biblical preaching study for us. Um, so we might pray to the end that we use that time well as, as we focus on that. So have I encouraged you to at least consider? I hope so. I hope so.